Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's CITI program webinar. Today's topic is remote informed consent. The same, but different, but still the same. Now, let me tell you about today's presenter. Belinda Smith is a research education specialist with 34 years of experience, beginning with clinical research coordination and evolving into human subject protections. She currently oversees education and outreach for the University of Kentucky Human Research Protection Program and provides regulatory consultation for the Office of Research Integrity and Institutional Review Boards. And now I'm going to pass the mic to Belinda. Thank you, Margaret. Well, with no relevant conflicts with respect to this webinar, let's begin exploring remote informed consent. So these are our learning objectives, but in summary, we wanna revisit the requirements that apply to informed consent in general, then examine options for adapting to a remote process. By the end of the webinar, we want you to be aware of the regulatory requirements, but also be familiar with latitude extended by regulatory agencies due to the public health emergency. We'll end with exploring some challenges and solutions, and I'll share some examples based on our local experience at my institution. So it was just about this time a year ago that the disruptive reality of living in a pandemic left researchers scrambling to adapt human research to accommodate participants either restricted from travel or quarantined at home or even isolated for infection control reasons. Research teams and IRBs work to develop alternatives for processes that would normally be done face-to-face, -face, like informed consent, which for us is the cornerstone of ethical research. So we've become all too familiar with the concept of remote, as many of us are working remotely. It's been adopted for schools, church, jury duty, almost anything imaginable that is a public gathering. But in the broadest, most simplistic terms, remote consent occurs when the research participant and the study personnel obtaining consent are physically separated. We'll start by revisiting those components and features of informed consent in general. So for the features, we'll actually reach back to the Belmont Report, which even then used the phrase, the reasonable volunteer. And the three fundamental features include the extent and utility of the information provided, facilitation of understanding, and then voluntary nature of the consent process. So key components used to accomplish that include appropriate forms, which in our context would mean you have the required elements, any additional elements that apply, it's clear and understandable text, no exculpatory language, organized in a way that facilitates comprehension and beginning with key information. A reasonable person would weigh in making a decision. Correct people, maybe your authorized study personnel, potential participants, legally authorized representatives, parents, or, or any others that's mandated by your institution or the particular situation. Process is one of my favorite areas. In our hands-on workshop, we actually practice and do mock sessions where investigators learn about listening and engaging in dialogue to move from the reasonable person concept to the idiosyncratic person concept. So learning what that individual's baseline knowledge is, what's their perception of research, health literacy level, motivations, reservations, and that type of thing. Also, the process involves strategies to enhance understanding, like teach back or clarification. And then as far as timing should occur before participation with sufficient opportunity to consider and then continuing throughout participation. Documentation is focusing more on the signatures and notations in the subject record. And of course, archiving according to whatever uh, applicable retention requirements. And of course, all of the above approved by an IRB. Now breaking the components out illustrates how you really can't skip a step that you would normally do in person. So if in person, you would do some dialogue and, and interaction, you would not want to just mail out a form and then retrieve the signed document. The subject needs to have a readable version of the form in hand. 
if it's not face to face, you may have some steps for identifying the correct people or even connecting all that need to be at the table uh, for a process that's virtual. You still need to allow for the adequate exchange. And then you may have some extra steps in regard to documentation. And once again, all approved by the IRB. So dealing with these, each scenario on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, sometimes it's regulatory technical issues. Other times it's more ethical or practical issues. And remote consent may involve different means to an end, but the end is the same. And that's to provide adequate information, facilitate understanding and promote voluntariness. And this past year, we have certainly seen that adversity triggers adaptation and necessity breeds innovation, but eventually what's novel becomes commonplace. And if we use what we've learned to streamline workflow, address scheduling limitations, promote inclusion, and reduce geographic and socioeconomic barriers to participation, then we'll all be better for it. With this, I'll turn it over to Margaret for questions. Great, our first question, uh, what should a site do to certify e-consent as Part 11 compliant? Well, for the FDA regulated studies that need to certify, FDA's e-consent FAQs does say that a sponsor or an investigator could rely on a statement from the vendor um, of whatever electronic system you're using to obtain either electronic signature or full electronic consent. Um, you would want that to have information on how the signature is created and how the system meets the relevant requirements in Part 11. In addition, you also may want to document that your site has fulfilled any of the applicable customer requirements, though. So either on how you implemented the system or your training documentation or policies on password controls, that type of thing as well, just to cover both bases. Okay. 